Let us know you're on. Perfect. So I'm Melissa Aldrich. I am a member of the Hampshire Bird Committee, and I am very happy to introduce Paul Roberts to the group. He founded the Eastern Mass Hawk Watch in 1976, establishing the watches at Wachusett Mountain, Mount Watatic, and Plum Island. He led the Hawk Migration Association of North America for four years and the Northeast Hawk Watch for over 20 years, but is still learning more about hawk identification and behavior every day. So without further delay, Paul, please begin. Okay. Thank you very much. I enjoy uh, being with you tonight. You're at the beginning of the most intense period of migration, the next three weeks. So hopefully this will help you prepare for what you might see. And the best thing that I can advise you is to get out and look as often as possible, especially when winds are from the west, anywhere around the north to even the northeast. Uh, you have your best chance to see the most hawks over the next three weeks, but some of the hawks you'll see uh, lesser numbers, but you'll see some species in greater numbers in October and November. Um, what we'll do tonight is look at what you see in a couple of slides, then I'll show you what you should look for. What do hawks give you that help you identify them the way you actually see them in the field? And we'll look at small and medium-sized hawks. We'll focus more time on the broadwing, the star of September, and then we'll look at the large and largest hawks. Now, just take a second and look at this bird and see if you can pick out several field marks that make it easy to identify. This is what you'd see in a typical field guide. And then maybe you'd see a photo like this. What do you see that gives you a good clue as to the species of hawk? Now think about that and then identify the species shown in this slide. <laughs> so you're not going to talk about the color of the wings. What you see in this slide are two species. One is right here and is much larger than anything else. And anything else is a broad-winged hawk. So you see the silhouette of several dozen broad-winged hawks here, which are much smaller, less dense than the uh, turkey vulture that you're looking at, the bigger bird up here. Um, so this is a real life situation you would love to see, but you would know this is broad wings with a turkey vulture. Now look at this. It's not a good shot. You often don't get a good view. Okay. And you may be debating with the person next to you. And that's one thing I would recommend is to get out hawk watching with someone else because they may look at things differently, see things differently than you do. If they can be an experienced hawk watcher, all the better, the quicker you'll learn. So do you see the color of the eyes? The color of the wings? Uh, the beautiful barring on the breast? No, you see shape and relative size. So here you see long, narrow wings, tapered particularly on the hand, very tapered on the hand. This perspective Hi. you see. I'm okay, but how are you doing? Hand. Now, doing? this bird. Excuse me, Paul. Yeah. Could all of you mute your computers, laptops, iPads, phones? Please. Uh, so, uh, how long uh, did it take? 
Okay. 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 Now look at this bird. This bird is kiting, hanging in the air. This is the same species as in this photo. So here you have a peregrine falcon flying away and you get the long tapered wings. Here it's actually soaring with the tail splayed and the wing splayed. And you see that long wing pointed with the hands particularly long and tapered, but it's not how you expect to see it. So this is peregrine falcon. You don't see the malar bar. You don't see the barring. You don't see the heavy streaking. I can't tell you if this is an adult or an immature, but I can tell you it's definitely a peregrine. And look at this bird. This is actually a pretty good view you might have on a hawk watch site. The wings aren't long and tapered, but they're fairly long and not as thick as you would think you'd see on a buteo. The tail is long and relatively narrow. So what you're looking at is sort of an elegantly shaped exhibitor with a big head. This is a Cooper's hawk. Can't tell you the age, can't tell you the sex. Although actually, I'd lay odds this is a female Cooper's hawk for reasons we'll see in just a minute. Because this is what you get when you're hawk watching. And I apologize for the motorcycle that's going down my road, if you hear that in the background. The things that hawks give you are size. Now, this is not what is usually described in most guides. They say, don't go by size. It's very difficult. It is difficult to separate, but what I want to show you tonight is how you can use everything the hawks give you to identify them fairly quickly. In terms of size, is it blue jay, crow sized, red tail sized, or bald eagle? If you can put it in one of those four categories, you have it down to two or at most three species to work with. And one thing to realize that in, in size, uh, there's reverse sexual dimorphism so that in most hawks, the females are larger than the males. The second thing they give you, as you saw in those photos, was shape and several different uh, genera have very specific, pardon the pun, shapes. The exhibitors, relatively short, thick, rounded wings and a long, narrow tail. Buteos, long, thick, rounded wings and a short, thick tail. Falcons, long, pointed wings and a moderately long tail. And you get familiar with those shapes by looking at, say, the silhouette guide that is one of the things you can download uh, and it will show you the basic shape of the others. Then they show you their behavior. Are they soaring or gliding or in powered flight or in hovering or stooping? In each of those instances, the bird has a different shape. So when you see a bird that you know, like you saw a red tail, I mean, a red shoulder and a Cooper's, watch them going away, not just coming towards you. Watch what they look like when you see them going away at a distance, the shape and their behavior. If you see them kettling in large numbers in Massachusetts, you know you're looking at a broadwing uh, in September. If you see a dihedral, uh, the wings above the horizontal in a V shape. There are shallow dihedrals and steep dihedrals, but that dihedral would take it down to one of three or four birds. If you have a steep dihedral on an eagle-sized bird, you know it's a turkey vulture. Hey, Paul, we have yeah. a question. What is stooping? Stooping is, is when they want to gain speed um, 
perhaps to move a, a um, long distance quickly, but more likely to harass another bird. So you'll see a Merlin stooping on a red tail or a Cooper's hawk stooping on uh, a broad wing. And then in dog fighting, what you see is two birds engaging in an aerial dog fight, which are almost always exhibitors and uh, most often sharp shinned hawks. So if you have dog fighting, the odds are overwhelming that it's one of two species. If it's dihedral, you see a big dihedral and it's eagle sized, it's a turkey vulture. If it's red tail sized, it's a red tail. If it's smaller than that, uh, it'll be a uh, northern harrier. Then seasonal abundance, and I'll emphasize that tonight. Um, we'll get an idea of the calendar of migration, but uh, you see most kettles in September, and that's because our most abundant raptor by about 80% of what we see are broad-winged hawks, and they move in a short period of time, primarily in two to three weeks in September, and therefore we see them in large numbers. And you'll see that uh, certain peaks when you are most likely to see certain species, though you may see individuals over a period of months. Then Paul, you another question. Uh, yeah. What is kettling? Kettling is, uh, some people call it a boil. Um, that is when the hawks want to gain lift and they fly into a thermal, a column of hot air rising. And because that hot air rising gives them free lift, which they get by soaring in that thermal, you will get five, 10, 100, 1,000, at times multiple thousands of hawks in one column of air moving around. We'll see that later. Uh, so that's kettling. Uh, the broad wing will kettle in significant numbers, but anything else migrating at the time the broad wings are in that kettle can go into that thermal and use it. And they know it's good lift because all of those broad wings are using it. If you get kettles in October, November, they're not broad wings and they may be gulls or at times crows. Crows don't soar, but gulls migrate at times in large kettles, um, but not in September. That is a broad wing. And with seasonal abundance, as I said, 80% of, of the hawks we see in New England are broad wings, and they move through primarily in three weeks, the second and third, and possibly the fourth week of September. Then the next thing you see is patterns of contrast. If you have good views, you'll see the contrast which you didn't see in any of those other photos, but you'll, you'll see them tonight. So they're best seen in flight, particularly when the bird is soaring, when it has its wings out extended and its tail usually fanned to get the most lift. And that's when you'll have the best view of the contrast. And as I say here, most beauteous exhibitors and falcons uh, the juveniles are streaked brown vertically. Most adult buteos, exhibitors, and falcons are barred horizontally. They have finer barring going across rather than up and down the chest. And that barring is usually red. Uh, that will affect the contrast that you see. But color is one of the last things you see. And that is seen best when a, a, a bird is perched or in photos. And then finally, don't use voice to identify hawks in migration because 98% of 
all hawks are silent in migration. So it won't help you. And that oh, means, quick question. What's the difference between soaring and gliding? Soaring is, as I said, when the wings are extended and fanned to get the maximum lift, free lift. They don't have to work. In a broad wing, as we'll, we'll see in uh, a few minutes, they soar to get altitude and then they want to glide and, and they don't have to work hard because they're soaring in a thermal, a column of hot air rising over a cold surface, uh, which happens on September days, particularly when you have a cold front. Um, when they get to the top of that thermal, they glide in the direction they want to move. And so to glide, they tuck their wings and assume a different shape. They close their tail and they can do a steep glide or a shallow glide. The steeper the glide, the faster they move. The shallower the glide, the farther they move. And then if they go into powered flight, um, they're pumping their wings and there are certain clues when they pump their wings that you can use. There are only a few hawks that can actively hover. So if you see one hovering, you automatically have it down to one of two or three species. And depending on the size, you've got it down to one of two. Um, so one of the things to realize in identifying hawks in flight is that, and I think I'm quoting Madonna here, size matters. On the left, you have our largest diurnal raptor. On the right, you have our largest buteo. There's a slight difference in size. You're able to pick this up pretty easily, even when the birds are far away. But here, one of the clues is you see the difference in the in the excuse me, uh, in the in the silhouette that um, the head and tail are pretty big on this eagle, and it looks like a flying plank. And then look at the sky that you see between the slotting on the primaries. You see a lot of sky. The rough leg. Our largest buteo is in a partial soar here, and it's so much smaller, you see very little sky between the primaries. So when you see the finger sticking out, very obvious, that's a large bird. But right away, you have an eagle-sized bird on the left, a red-tail-sized bird on the right. And that's where this sheet comes in very handy. And I encourage you to download it and to mark it up because this is organized by size, the relative ranking of the largest to the smallest. And then I show the wing spread and the weight. And in each case, the wing spread, the smallest is a male and the largest is a female. And the same for weight. The smallest is a male, the largest is the female. And so you can see there's considerable difference in wing spread and weight, but you have four very clear categories. On one through three, and, and what I'll emphasize tonight is make the best use of your time. You have a good chance of seeing three large, birds, three eagle-sized birds anytime you go out, and that's number two, number three, and number four. So th these days you have, an, an, and this is rough odds, how, how frequently you might see them, how abundant they are if you hawk watch all fall long, that you can see a bald eagle on average once every two hours. You see a golden eagle once every 126 hours. So which do you see more? Which do you want to focus the time learning? Eat bald eagle, turkey vulture, osprey. If you see a red tail sized hawk, 
and here, watch herring gulls, because red tails are about the size of herring gulls. Uh, if you see a red tail sized hawk, the odds are overwhelming. It's a red tail. Overwhelming. Rough legs, you see one rough leg for every thousand hours of hawk watching. Red tails, you see one every two and a half hours, and that's migrating. You'll see local birds more often than that. The only other bird you see very frequently there is a northern harrier, which is about 1.5. And the difference between a harrier and a red tail, as you'll see, is obvious. Then you get down to the third category, crow-sized birds. And the crow and blue jay-sized birds are much more abundant. And here, you see on average a broad-winged hawk 10 per hour if you're out hawk watching uh, 100 hours. Red-shouldered hawk, one every 17 hours. And a cooper's hawk, one every two hours. If you know broad wings and cooper's hawk, red-shouldered and peregrine falcons are going to be very obvious and easy to identify. And then you get down to the last category. Watch morning doves. Morning doves look a lot like a merlin at times. They're fast, they explode. They're about the size of a sharp shin. Um, watch morning doves and blue jays coming and going. Half of all the birds you can see are going away from you. And those are the most difficult to identify. So work on birds going away from you. Watch what you know it is when it leaves you. And then here on Merlins, they're increasingly common. You see one about every three hours. Kestrels used to be uh, one of our most common. They're uh, less abundant now, but you see one about every two hours. And sharp shinned hawks are the most abundant, though declining significantly. You see two about every hour that you're out hawk watching. Those numbers are all relative abundance, and it implies that you're out looking for three months uh, and at least 100 hours at a, at a, at a uh, not in a day, but 100 hours coverage over those three months. Okay, I've got a crow-sized bird. Actually looks a little smaller than the crow. Cooper's hawk almost certainly a male cooper's hawk because it's smaller. The female might be as large or larger than the crow. And you'll, you'll see crows harassing raptors. Watch crows in flight. They don't soar, but they'll give you a good marker for uh, interpreting the size of the bird you do see. Then look at the shape. As I mentioned earlier, to the left, we have three falcons. They're marked on that handout as to Budios, falcons, and exhibitors. The falcons, distinctive shape of the long pointed wings, moderately long, narrow tail, and that's for flying largely in the open. The silhouettes of the uh, falcons, if it's a crow-sized bird, it's a peregrine. If it's a blue jay sized bird or a little bigger, it's a kestrel or a merlin. In the exhibitors, we have three. Uh, if you want to study northern goshawk, or now uh, American goshawk, that is roughly once every 200 hours, you might see one. Whereas for sharp shins, it's two every hour. And for kestrels, uh, excuse me, and Cooper's hawks, it's one every two hours. Uh, so focus on sharp shins and Cooper's hawks because you're going to see a lot more of them. And if you'll see a goshawk, you'll go, holy crap, that's not a Cooper's hawk. 
Although 90% of the time, birds that people think are goshawks are in fact juvenile female Cooper's hawks. But if you know Cooper's hawks, goshawks are gonna be very simple. Buteos on the right, long, thick, rounded wings, short, thick tail. They're the archetypal soaring birds. And as we'll see, they give you a pretty good clue as to their size. If it's a red tail sized buteo, it's a red tail. If it's a crow sized buteo, it's a broad wing or a red shoulder. And although you see more shoulders in the valley and central Massachusetts, particularly southern mass, than you do in northern mass, red shoulders have been expanding their breeding population throughout the state and into southern New Hampshire and Maine. So we're seeing a lot more red shoulders. If you've got a, a crow-sized buteo uh, migrating, you have 10 uh, broad wings on an average hour and one red shoulder for every 17 hours. When you know your broad wings, you're gonna recognize the red shoulder because it's different. Now, I, I won't ask you to speak out loud, but look at this photograph. And how would you describe the item on the left? Large, round, egg-shaped, bright red. Um, and what is it? It's a balloon. But wait, what's that thing on the right? It's small, it's flat, it's darker than that thing on the left. But what is it? It's a balloon. It has just changed its attributes, its field characters in response to a change in air pressure. And back to that question, I think, Allison, as to uh, uh, what is soaring and what is gliding? The difference between soaring and gliding is how hawks adjust to get what they want from the air. And so they change the air pressure on them by changing their shape. The air pressure inside the balloon changed its shape. When you release that air pressure, it becomes quite different, not only in size, but in shape and color. Keep that in mind. So watch birds soaring. And then when you see them start to glide, you see far less than you do when they're soaring. But if you watch them gliding away, you may see them soar up again at the end of that glide and get a better idea as to the shape. So here, what do birds give us? Long wings, narrow wings, sounds like a falcon long, narrow tail. Uh, the wings are above the horizontal. It's a dihedral. That's a specific behavior only a few hawks have. And it has a bright white rump patch, very sharp rectangular pattern of contrast at the base of the tail. Uh, and then you see the slotting in the primaries. You see a lot of sky. So you know it's a large bird. It's a red tail sized bird with a dihedral, a sharp dihedral, small head, long tail, Northern Harrier. Here's a bird in a glide. So notice how the wings are bowed. It's a bird seeking to move faster and go farther than if it were soaring. It's left the soar. And you, you see the wings may not look that long, but you have a very distinctive pattern of contrast with the black wrist patches, the white wing linings, the white body, and a white head on top that you may see some distance away. This pattern of contrast is diagnostic. And the behavior, if you squint at this picture, the bird looks like it's uh, a shallow flying W. 
I had one young kid in one of my programs said, no, it looks more like an M to me. But this is a typical gliding posture for an eagle-sized bird. That pattern of contrast is diagnostic. And again, look at the slotting that you see between the primaries where they're splayed. The, the faster the bird is going, the tighter the primaries are and the less uh, space you'll see. Here you see an osprey soaring, long, narrow wings, eagle-sized bird. That pattern of contrast is diagnostic. But you have a much smaller bird to the right, also soaring, with a totally different pattern of contrast. That's a broad-winged hawk, an adult broadwing. So it's smaller than an eagle, smaller than a red tail. It's a crow-sized buteo. You can tell by the shape of the wings. And that pattern of contrast on the tail is diagnostic of an adult broad-winged hawk. Now, I, I forgot to ask you to do one other thing. I'm going to go back here to the balloon. If you can see me in your picture, I'd like you to put your hands out like this, your elbows at your side, and flap your hands as quickly as you can. Okay, you can do that pretty quickly. Now, watch out so you don't knock over any drinks, but extend your arms all the way and flap your arms as quickly as you can. It takes a lot longer. You have far fewer flaps. So when a bird is flapping like this, it's a red tail sized hawk or bigger. They can't flap quickly. The peregrine may be the one exception to that. Uh, and if you see it flapping like this, you're looking at a blue jay sized hawk, a, a sharp shin or kestrel or merlin. So eagles and red tails and birds of similar size tend to soar up in large wide circles. Sharp shins and cooper's hawks can soar up in much tighter circles. So you can identify, am I looking at a small bird close or a large bird far, far away? Turkey vultures and eagles take big, lazy circles. Sharp shins really don't, much smaller circles. Okay, we go back uh, here, we saw the broadwing. Here the broadwing is the largest bird. That pattern of contrast, thick dark and thick white bands, in the tail where you see three white bands, sometimes you may see only two, uh, is diagnostic of a crow-sized buteo. And behind it, you have a bird that's not a buteo, long pointed wings, very tapered hands. This is a smaller than crow-sized falcon and you see the pattern of contrast in the tail, thick, dark, multiple narrow white bands, diagnostic of a Merlin. So we have a crow-sized broadwing, a modo-sized Merlin. And the Merlin, you can also identify because it will harass anything. If a Merlin has a chance to aggravate any other raptor, it will take advantage of that opportunity. Okay, now we're going to go fairly quickly through the list here. Uh, this is your smallest. Technically, the shark shin is the smallest of our diurnal raptors. They found males that are smaller than kestrels, but most most guys will still tell you the kestrel is the uh, the smallest of our diurnal raptors. The male. And the kestrel is very colorful. If you see it well, the, the males have the blue upper wing coverts, the rusty back, the blue crown. What should really stand out is a reddish tail, a, a brick red tail with a dark terminal band and a sharp pattern of contrast on the cheek. 
an ocular pa uh, 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 an ear patch and a malar bar that contrast with a white cheek on a small bird. The other thing you see, especially on the male kestrel, are the row of pearls on the flight feathers that will show light through them. The female, and this is one of the, the rare instances of sexual dichromatism where the females look very different in color from the males. The female does not have the blue wing coverts, the blue crown, the bright orangish red tail, uh, but she has the distinctive pattern of contrast on the cheek and she has a finely uh, banded tail. And she has rows of dots, but they're not white and don't really show bright light through the way they do on a male. So you can identify male kestrels from female kestrels. They're a very light bird and buoyant when they flap. And unlike the Merlin, they can hover. So they can stop and beat their wings rapidly looking for prey, including insects in the air. And here's a female kestrel hovering. And from underneath, you can see the females are more heavily streaked, uh, like a juvenile, but adult females are streaked in the kestrel. You see the tail is finely banded, looks reddish brown, but you see that distinctive pattern of contrast on the head. That pattern of contrast is diagnostic and the hovering is diagnostic for a small raptor. The other small falcon that we see is the merlin. We're seeing fewer kestrels these days and more merlins everywhere. They're breeding in the state now. The merlin, look, no sharp pattern of contrast. It has a faint malar bar. Merlins are all heavily streaked underneath and heavily patterned on their underwing. They have a, a, a relatively thick arm and a long tapered hand, but they're actually shorter winged proportionally than a peregrine. Now, the other thing that you see here, and I apologize for the my cursor uh, causing my slides to jump, you see the dark tail with narrow white bands as we saw on that earlier image. So when you have a dark tail with narrow white or gray bands, that's a Merlin. Seen from above, no sharp pattern of contrast. Merlins are either dark brown or bluish brown. Here you see the, the falcon shape of the wing, most obvious here on the pointed hand, but you see the distinctive Merlin pattern on the tail. And Dave Brown, who some of you may know, uh, a hawk watcher from Warwick, uh, Mass, um, told me he had a phrase for differentiating a kestrel from a merlin. A kestrel flies on the air. It's buoyant, and it can stop to hover. A merlin flies through the air. And another good rule of thumb is if you see a falcon coming and you have a time you have time to call people's attention to it, it's a kestrel. If you say, I've got a falcon and it's gone past you, that's a Merlin. They're speeding everywhere. Now, the other blue jay sized bird we have is sharp shinned hawk. And that takes us into the crow size birds. Here we have juvenile male sharp shinned hawk, female sharp shinned hawk, noticeably bigger, male Cooper's hawk, female Cooper's hawk. You can tell a female Cooper's hawk from a male Sharpie easily. How do you tell a male Cooper's hawk from a female Sharpie? Well, several things. With the Sharpie, if you look at them and squint, the streaking is heavy and noodly, 
and it goes down the breast and the belly. So overall, they look darker underneath. And the tail looks shorter. Males' tails are often notched, but not necessarily. And both male and female have essentially a straight terminal edge to the tail. In the Cooper's hawks, when you squint, the Cooper's looks lighter because the streaking is finer and narrower, and it tends not to go uh, on the uh, belly. It's primarily on the breast. So a difference in contrast, and then look at the size of the heads. And the female Cooper's hawk is the bird most often confused with a goshawk because they are so big and impressive. The other thing on Cooper's hawk is you see the tail is down here is rounded. The outer tail feathers are shorter than the inner tail feathers. Uh, so the tail is rounded and it has bright white, as we see here, bright white terminal bands on the tail the Sharpie has very little white as a terminal band on the tail, and it's dirty white, not refrigerator white. So what we have here are two male Sharpshins, adults. So you see they're colored very differently, but the shape is essentially the same. Two male, female Sharpshins that are much more bulky, obviously, than the males. Two male Cooper's hawks, and you notice a little difference here in variation. The Cooper's hawks, you see that rounded tail and the fact that it looks longer in flight and the size of the heads. And here we have an adult female Cooper's hawk. The other way you can tell them apart quite often at the feeder as well is Sharp Shin's legs look like toothpicks. Cooper's legs look like sticks or pipe cleaners. So here we have a Sharpie in flight, short, thick, rounded wings, relatively long, narrow tail. We see a little bit of white, but we, we, we see streaking here. The hand is small. And you notice how little slotting there is on these small primaries. So you don't see any sky. This is a fast bird. The adult looks different in terms of the um, barring on the body, the red barring, but the size and the shape are essentially the same. The tail is straight terminal edge, again, the separation in the primaries is very small. And as you see here, the exhibitors, the flight feathers underneath are barred, which is not the case with kestrels. Here you oh, have- quick question. Um, what happened to the birds in the previous slides? Um, how were they captured? Uh, these are birds in the uh, Canadian Museum, specimens that have been collected and they have been selected by John Ruddy here as representative. And there aren't that many Cooper's Hawks in Canada. Here you have the uh, juvenile Cooper's Hawk, brown above. The adults look a little bluish. Small head, long, narrow tail, straight terminal band. Notice the occipiter bands on the tail are thick, gray, narrow, dark bands, not the sharp contrast. And it's a very long tail compared to the Kestrel or a Buteo. Then you get into the Cooper's Hawks. You see the big head in front of the wing. The streaking is primarily on the breast, not on the belly. Longer, narrower tail, rounded, and more white on the terminal uh, tail band. Another Cooper's hawk, quite finely streaked on this one. Long, 
tail rounded and the white is more obvious. The white on the terminal edge of the tail wears as the bird ages over the winter. So there's less in the spring than there is in the fall. And here you have an adult Cooper's hawk. From the robustness, I'd say it's a female. She's tucked in a glide, so the arms are bowed and the hands are flat. And you see the tail is closed and it's long and rounded. And there's that obvious terminal white band. And the head is big. Cooper's hawk. Here's the star of September, the Broadwing. We may see a lot of them perched, especially this month. Uh, the adults are barred red. Uh, they may have a red bib and then be more lightly barred on the lower breast and belly. And you see the obvious thick, dark, thick white bands in the tail. The uh, Broadwing breeds in the Eastern deciduous forest all of them migrate south and they totally evacuate their breeding ground, which only also happens with ospreys and rough legs. But the broadwing is our most abundant migratory raptor and they move down the interior coast of Mexico on the Gulf of Mexico into South America. And what this means as so many birds evacuate this large area is that we get large numbers of them. Here is Hawk Mountains, seasonal timing, September 15th. They get most of their flight a week either side of September 15th. That's our case. September 13th to 17th, we've had days of 10 to 20,000 broad wings in two to three hours. So when they go, they may all go at once. And you may go out hawk watching and see a broad wing or two earlier. But if you're not out there from, say, 9.30 to 3.30, you may miss them. And a lot of people have because they left early. So you see the concentration. All of these birds are going in a short span to Mexico. And they know they've got to get out. You see hardly any in October. Uh, so for broad wings, get out between now and the 24th. You may see some going into October. But 95% of all broad wings go in those, those two weeks. Here's the broad wing soaring. Uh, you see that distinctive tail pattern of the adult? Just realize that half of all broad wings aren't adults. So you're not going to see that tail on half the birds. Relatively tapered wings for a beautio. And you see the slotting on a few primaries. Uh, that's the best you're going to do. But it tells you that the, the short length of the primaries, that this is a crow-sized bird. And the wings look almost tapered like a candle flame. From underneath, if you squint, they look largely light. They're not as heavily patterned as a soaring exhibitor. And here you have a bird that is just molting into adult plumage, but it does have the adult tail. Here you have a typical silhouette of a soaring broadwing. Immature beautios can all have a wing window like this coming through the base of the flight feathers. That doesn't tell you anything as to species. That thick black, thick white, with only a few bands tells you it's a broadwing. And this is the tapered flame of a broadwing soaring, that the hand is tapered. This is to me the archetypal glide pattern of a broadwing. When it wants to achieve distance, the wings are bowed here. The primaries are closed because it doesn't want lift, it's gliding. 
and the trailing edge is straight. And you may not see the tail pattern, but here you can faintly see the thick white, thick dark bands. Half of all broad wings are immatures. They're streaked. And the streaking is more on the flanks, on the outside, and it may be partially around the belly. The tail is finely banded, very finely banded, no sharp contrast. And if you uh, look here, you see two adults below and up above you see the wing windows on this bird. And they're in a typical glide posture. If you see three birds gliding together, crow sized, keep an eye on them. They're getting lift. They'll go up higher and get smaller. Anything may join them to take advantage of that free lift. So here you, again, you have a turkey vulture and a broad wing. Notice you can see the slotting between the, the feathers on the turkey vulture. It looks like a headless eagle. The broad wing, you just go by the basic shape. You can't see the slotting at this distance. As they go up and get free lift, if there are other birds in the area, they're attracted to that free lift too. And so you'll get them joining a thermal. And they'll circle around in a beautiful, beautiful uh, spiral. And you may get literally thousands in one kettle. And again, most of these birds are broad wings, but you can look for a bigger or a smaller bird. But this is a, a, a not uncommon scene on one of those big days. And then you may get something like this. Just an incredible aerial mobile, uh, one of the largest, most magnificent visible migrations people can see. And this is from uh, Corpus Christi, Texas. You can see this in Massachusetts at several different places if you're there on the right day at the right time. And I can't tell you what that is except that it's in September with winds from the west around to the northeast. Here we have red shoulder. It's a bigger beautio. You see crescent-shaped wing windows at the base of the outer flight feathers. That crescent shape is diagnostic. Immature broad wings have a tail very similar to the red shoulder, so they can be very tough to tell apart. Look for those wing windows. It's very hard that you see, or very rare that you see red shoulders on red shoulders. If you do, you've got a very good view. The immatures are more heavily streaked below, more evenly streaked than broad wings. The tail is longer than on a broad wing, but again, the tail pattern is very similar. And here you can see above, the wing windows, crescent shape, and below the wing windows on a juvenile. And here you see them at the base of the flight feathers on an adult. Notice the thick, dark, narrow light bands. And the red shoulder looks very much like an excipiter in the barring, very, very heavily barred on the flight feathers, like an excipiter. Red shoulder from below, smaller head than the uh, broad wing or red tail. The adults are beautifully barred red. And then you see the narrow white bands with thick dark bands. And again, you can see that crescent shaped window at the tip of the wings. Peregrine falcon, you get into the largest of the crow size bird, long tapered wings, the hands particularly tapered, sharp pattern of contrast on the cheek, Heavily streaked, looks dark. Our largest falcon. Hey, Do Paul, we have a few questions that have come in. Yeah. Uh, have any watchers used radar or other technology to track and count migrating hawks rather than estimating with the human eye? 
Uh, to track, yes. To to follow flight paths, it's hard to determine numbers, uh, and so they really can't they can't determine numbers well off uh, weather radar. But you can track them on radar. Uh, that's broad wings primarily. The other species, it's very hard unless you're using very uh, narrow range vertical radar to follow individual birds. But you can track kettles of broadwings. Here you have a, a peregrine soaring. So you can see it isn't the shape that you saw on the previous bird because the tapered hand is fully splayed and the arms are about equal length. So that the, they're straight on the on the arms on the leading and trailing edge, but the hand very sharply tapered and you get that pattern of contrast on a fairly long tailed bird. The adults, again, that pattern of contrast, the adults will have a white bib and be finely barred. But this, this is a more typical shape of a, a bird in a very shallow glide. Paul, another question. Will you see yeah. a pale head on either the red-shouldered or broad-winged hawks? Uh, yes. You're more likely to see it on a uh, broad wing than you see it here on the red shoulder, but we have some blondes uh, that, that look blonde when you see them on juveniles in particular. So if you see this bird, you've had your bird for the day. Uh, we won't spend a lot of time here. Um, we're talking about your American goshawk. Heavily streaked, much more heavily streaked than a Cooper's hawk. All the way down in Connecticut at Lighthouse, they like to yell, dirty pants, dirty pants, when they see a goshawk, because the streaking goes all the way down uh, to the undertail covers, includes the undertail covers. The tail looks so thick, it looks like an extension of the body, and it is rounded. This is a red tail sized exhibitor, but you rarely see them. And when you do, it's mainly late October and November. And as I said, you see one about every 200 hours, whereas Cooper's hawks, you see more in the nature of one every two hours. So uh, most goshawk photos I get are actually female Coopers. Here you have the uh, juvenile coopers from, I mean, goshawk from above. The eye stripe is generally quite obvious, though all exhibitors may have an eye stripe. You get this pattern of uh, spots on the upper wing, which is pretty diagnostic. And then you've got the long rounded tail, which again, looks like an extension of the body. And if you see the tail bands, silhouetted in white and wavy. Uh, that's diagnostic of a goshawk. Paul, another question. What is the trigger, going back to uh, migration, what is the trigger for broad wing migration? Uh, if I had that answer, I'd have more money than I do. So there's a debate, but it's, it's and it's a question right now, do they go earlier? because it's hotter or do they go later because it's hotter? Uh, we don't know exactly why, but it's very precisely timed. And it's certainly in the Northern range triggered um, by temperature, I think. But I can't say that for the continental population. Here you have a goshawk. The adults are barred gray. Uh, I would say you can't mistake them, but people still make uh, mistakes of Cooper's hawks. You see this black eye patch with the uh, eye stripe that you see in this picture is very obvious on the uh, adult. The tail is rounded and an, again, an extension of the body so that it looks shorter than it may on a Cooper's hawk. This has got to be an adult female. It's so heavily 
um, robust in the breast and belly. Um, and that the females are noticeably bigger in goshawks than the males. If you see a gray buteo like this, it's a goshawk, an exhibitor. The hairier, we get into the red tail sized birds as we, we did with the goshawk. The hairier has the long, almost falcon like wings. The size is obvious because of the slotting in the primary. The long tail with the bright rectangular rump patch and that dihedral, the wings above the horizontal. The immatures are orangish red beneath. The tails are banded and they're often called the ring-tailed hawk in Europe. The adult females become much lighter brown and they're heavily streaked. They're absolutely incredibly beautiful. So they look very different in color from the immatures, but same size, same shape. The males look so different, they were thought to be a separate species for several hundred years. The adult males are gray above with the primaries dipped in ink, the outer primaries, and that bright white rectangular rump patch. The shape is the same, the behavior is the same, the contrast and color are different. The male, often known as the gray ghost, looks silvery white beneath. And again, you see those uh, large primaries dipped in ink and they fly quite high, not always low the way you see them in the valley or along the coast. Red tail sized hawk, 90, 5% of all red tail sized hawks are red tails. So watch red tails. You see here their trapezoidal wing windows that show through the base of the flight feather. What's diagnostic is the dark patagium, the leading edge of the wing, the dark comma at the wrist, and the dark belly band. Immatures or otherwise, as you can see, very modeled. And that belly band can vary considerably. The tail is finely barred. From above, this might almost look like a red shoulder because the, the base of the tails. But here you can see this is a juvenile red tail. The mini jet puff marshmallows haven't fully dissolved in the cocoa. On the juveniles, the there's a bright white U-shaped rump patch on adults, the immatures is still streaked. It's not the bright white rectangular patch of a harrier. What's unusual about uh, red tails is that they kite. So they frequently turn into the wind and hang in motionless in the air. Uh, so you can see that's what this red tail is doing and looking to hunt for prey beneath it. The tail is red above, but looks pinkish below, depending on the light you have it in. But you see the dark patagium, the dark comma, and the dark belly band. The belly band in adults is finer and more varied than in the juveniles. And then it takes the birds uh, a full year to develop a red tail. Here you see a bird fairly low. You see that rump patch, which is U-shaped and not nearly as large and crisp as on a uh, harrier. Rough leg, we get very, very few. It's our largest beauty. What's diagnostic about them is big wrist patch, carpal patch, heavy uh, belly band, almost a cummerbund on the light morph, but we also get a dark morph. Very long, narrow wings. They have a dihedral, as you'll see, they're very light for their size, and they do actively hover, uh, generally up 30, 40 feet in the air looking for prey. But we see them rarely in late October or November.
We talked about the Osprey. I'll be going about five minutes more here. My apologies. Mm -hmm. uh, the, that pattern of contrast, carpal patch, white wing linings, white body, white crown, dark eye stripe, long tapered wings, eagle sized bird. But Osprey hover, eagles do not hover. We also get black vulture in increasing numbers, but they're still very rare. But uh, you have a better chance to see them in uh, central and western mass. Uh, small head, short tail, thick rounded wings. The outer primaries are brightly colored, so they stand out in contrast some distance away. We see much more of the eagle-sized turkey vulture, which has a small head, red in adults, black in juveniles, dark wing linings, dark body, silvery flight feathers with enormous primaries, heavily slotted. So you see that it's some distance away. This looks like the headless eagle. And they have that dihedral steep dihedral and most of their flight is rocking. The black vultures have a flat wing when they're soaring and gliding and they beat rapidly, shallow rapid beats. Turkey vulture can't do that. Everybody knows what this is, but the importance of this picture is it's a flying plank, a two by four with what's in front of the wing almost as big as what's behind the wing. The reason that's important is it takes four to seven years, excuse me, three to seven years for a bald eagle to get the white head and tail. So juvenile bald eagles look very much like a turkey vulture, but notice they have dirty white mottling on the primaries. They have a big head and beak and a long tail. So this is a juvenile bald eagle. As they get to be a year old, they start to change their pattern of contrast. So you go by shape and size. Again, notice the slotting in the primaries, obvious at a distance. Big head and beak, big tail. This is bird is molting and it's uh, just about two years old. They'll get lighter and get an osprey-like eye stripe with a light head. You can see this bird again is molting. It takes three years for a bald eagle to molt all of its feathers. You see white armpits on bald eagles for the first and second year. And actually until it's three, they may have a white armpit. But the pattern of contrast varies dramatically. The golden eagle, which is our rarest eagle seen only very late in the year, is, uh, excuse me, the golden eagle has a shallow dihedral. The red tail has a shallow dihedral. It's flat on the arms and up on the hands. The golden eagle has flat on the arms, up on the hands. You see that slotting? that tells you this is a big bird, but it has a small head and beak with a relatively long tail. And it has uh, more rounded wings, more muscular, almost red tail shape, where the trailing edge is S-curved. So it has more of a beautio type wing than the uh, bald eagle does. And then the pattern of contrast bright white patches at the base of the flight feathers, and those vary considerably. They're seen from above and below, but they may not have any white there, even though they're immature. They do have a white base to the tail with a dark terminal band on the tail. Bright white, not dirty white on a golden, small head, long tail. The adult golden, which we tend to see very few of because they go farther inland, um, are extremely modeled. And um, they look 
dark overall, you, unless you get a very close view, but you see the small head, long tail, no sharp patterns of white. You have three different years coloration of brown and gray in their feathers. Finally, bars, spectacular birds. You may not see the golden hackles, but you do sometimes. But this is mainly last week of October, November. And that's that's it. Do we have any other questions? Now's your chance, folks. If you have a question you want to ask, you can either uh, type it in or unmute your your audio and and ask. Hello. Yeah. Um, if you only have two hours to devote to hawk watching in uh, on a specific day in September, what would be the best time of day to see the best, hawks? The best time would be to go when they're there. <laughs> I can't tell you when they're there. If you if you have time with broadwings, it's most likely between 10 a.m. daylight and 4 p.m. daylight. And for years, when we didn't get anything the first four or five hours, we left until we had somebody who couldn't start hawk watching until three. <laughs> he came as other people were leaving. Twice he had over a thousand birds after everyone had left. So it depends on where the birds are the day before and what the weather is like. It is a crapshoot. Um, so if you have two hours, I would do either 10 to 12 or one to three, if only two hours. But- uh, Paul, did you said, say he said he had a thousand birds or did he have a thousand birds? He had a thousand birds, a thousand broad wings. They were, I mean, over a thousand broad wings both times. Wow. He learned something. And uh, on the day we had 20,000 birds, we had absolutely ideal migration conditions, but very few broadwings. Everyone was disappointed. One of my best friends went home. I was ready to go to work for the second half of the day. I had changed. I had put on my tie. I had one wingtip on. I was putting on my other wingtip when somebody said, I've got a kettle. I stopped and we had 20,000 hawks. If I had gone to work, if I had put that shoe on 15 minutes earlier, I wouldn't be alive speaking to you today. You just don't know. So well, there's, some, there's some other questions here too. Um, there's a hawk watch. Some people are saying on, on Sunday, does anybody know on Mount Tom? Does anybody know uh, the, the the time on that exact meeting point? Doesn't sound like it. Nope. No. Um, another question just for, for our Hampshire Bird Club. How, may, how might we get a copy of a few handouts, especially on the size one? Uh, I have them posted. Uh, it says get handouts here. Uh, click on this link, and the three handouts will that that Paul's shared with us are there. Another question is Mount Greylock a good location for hawk watching? It could be and should be, but people haven't had as much success uh, hawk watching uh, from the northern part of it. Um, because you want to try and get exposed to birds coming in. Um, actually, somebody's had more success hawk watching from their home in Adams than people have had on Greylock. So um, Greylock appears to be west of the primary flight path for broadwings coming out of eastern Canada, maritime Canada, Maine, and New Hampshire. And they tend to go between uh, probably Wachusett 
west to Putney in Vermont. And, and that that appears to be maybe a 50 to 60 mile funnel that takes the birds from a lot of Eastern Canada down. And you have fewer birds coming straight south through um, Vermont and New York that would go past Greylock. So it's worth trying and even stopping by in the road up and testing on a good day. But we've not had anybody that's really reported sizable flights there regularly. Yes, about that Mount Tom thing on Sunday, that is from 10, that is from 10 o'clock. It's not really hawk watching. It's like Tom Riccardi releases one or two hawks. This is every September. And these old people, Marcia Wilson, who rehabilitates owls, um, she will show a bunch of owls and have, give a talk about that. So that is the event of Mount Tom next Sunday, 10 o'clock. This is Janice. I just posted uh, Hampshire Bird Club is having uh, different people on different days at Skinner Mountain. And I put the link in uh, the chat where you can find the exact dates and times at Skinner. Great. Very good. Thanks. Yeah, Skinner can be very good. Skinner and Mount Tom can both have very good flights. They're, they're good sites that haven't been covered enough. I just got the report from Wachusett today and they had only 79 um, today. Um, the weather has not been that good. The best migration is on cold fronts, but we're not having a cold front for another 10 days or so. These birds cannot wait, they're moving. So we may not get the big concentrations that are caused by, in part by weather, keeping birds down um, and they may filter through, uh, sort of infiltrating the area. Uh, so it's good to get out as often as you can. We had people at Wachusett one day years ago. Again, it was a disappointment. A friend left, went shopping at Piggly Wiggly in Shrewsbury and had 600 broadwings in the parking lot, more than we had at Wachusett. You don't know where they're going to go, but the odds are generally that the best places are like Watadik, Wachusett, Pakmanadnock, Mount Tom, which is has not gotten the coverage uh, I think it merits lately. Any more questions? Well, uh, Paula, you might not be able to read the, the oh, chat, I but there are so many thank yous and so many, oh my God, how much information, interesting, informative. Uh, people are, look, sound like they're heading out to someplace to, to uh, hawk watch, but many, many thank yous. Once again, a bucket of knowledge into a symbol. Uh, uh, I, I'm trying to download and there's only one document, not three downloading. You have to look. There's one PDF, and there are you can see, visually see the other two documents. The one PDF has the shapes of the hawks. Yep. And then the two other ones. One is the the size. It talks about the sizes. Yeah, yeah but they don't download those two. If, if you uh, click on them, right click. You can right click on them. I'm. I'm okay. going. And then you can save the image. Yeah. Yes, as a photo. Okay, I'm not on a computer. I'm on. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. I get it. Okay. All right. Great. Somebody also made a suggestion of Skinner Mountain, Mount Tom, and Quabbin Tower. Ah. Here in the valley. Yeah. I, I would say going out with and and going to an a, a established hawk watch site or with a club trip, when you hawk watch with people who know more than you do, it's easier to learn. And at times you may see things they don't see. My wife sees birds differently than I do. So when we can't identify it, uh, you know, we discuss it. I had one case with uh, Bill Clark, who's a good friend of mine author of um, several of the best field guides. And we were together in Corpus Christi 
and we had a bird and I thought I knew what it was and he thought he knew what it was and we disagreed and the third guy behind us said that's okay I got a photo of the bird and he showed us the photo and we both agreed it was not the bird we had seen so it, it pays to have people there and get their input. And then, as I said, if you look at the birds you're most likely to see, you'll recognize the birds much easier that you don't know. And bring very good binoculars because there can be little specks a mile away in the sky. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Paul, there was one last question if there was a website that would help somebody learn further, learn more that you would recommend? A website? Yeah. Um, the, um, it varies so considerably. The, there, there is some good stuff on the Hawk Migration Association website. Um, and uh, you, you can Google some stuff and see some videos on YouTube of say broadwing kettles, things of that nature. Um, but there's nothing like getting out in the field and, and seeing what you really see, not what's in the guidebooks, but what do you really see in the field? And if you go out with somebody who has more experience, um, it makes it a richer time for you both. And I know at Wachusett, if you have questions, you just ask and somebody will explain to you why it wasn't that, but you'll realize also, let me put it this way, on a Sharpie Coopers, hard to differentiate. Brian Rusnicka, one of the best hawk watchers, saw a bird at Plum Island perched. It was a sharp shinned hawk. He took it took off, he photographed it, he thought it was a Coopers. But in two situations, he had two different ideas. And he sent it to me, Paul, what do you think? And I said, I think you're right. It looked like the bird had changed the species from being perched to in flight. So some of the birds you cannot absolutely identify. Uh, and Sharpie Coopers is tough. The toughest one I think is immature broadwing versus immature red shoulder, especially perched. But any other questions? Uh, Blueberry Hill this Saturday, uh in uh, West Granville, uh, there's a hawk watch. Yeah. I didn't hear that come up. Yeah, the it, it, it doesn't get as many as, say, Mount Tom or Skinner likely, but he gets, he gets decent numbers and they get very good views there. Yeah, it's true. So um, it's worth going and he's an experienced hawk watcher. So um, it's in his license plate. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it always it always helps to have other people there and also you can't cover the entire sky at Wachusett we have three people if they say I've got a bird but it's really distant everybody stops looking because they're so sharp eyed that they can pick up a bird when it crosses the New Hampshire border or so you so you think in reality you can't see them you can't see broadwings more than a mile and a half away. You're lucky if you see a, a golden eagle or bald eagle, you may see as far as three to five miles away. But broadwing kettles disappear by a mile and a half. So uh, it pays to have people who have better vision than you with you as well. Okay, um, any last minute questions? Uh, thank you, Paul, for this. This is great. I'm going to stop recording.